you know, this is a message that could really just shift you, just move you. A lot of times, messages like this move people out of obscurity into a powerful calling within their life, a powerful purpose. You know, we need to hear about the calling of God. I think when we think about our vision and our ministry, we, we should talk about the calling of God over and over and over again. And when I think about the calling of God, I can, I can only really think about myself, somebody who's experienced answering the call in their life, just like some of you have answered the call of God in your life. And one of the things I, I think about is that anything that's alive or anything that is uh, full of the spirit or anything that God chooses is always going to go through a different season of development that God takes you. And then he, I mean, he puts you on his potter's wheel. He, he takes you, he calls you out and then he separates you. And then he begins to put you through different seasons within your life. And, and this week I was thinking about my calling and I was thinking about the different seasons I've been through. And, and I want to tell you this is that you can't lead anything into success or into breakthrough until you've had success and breakthrough in your life first. You'll never lead a group of people to their calling until you understand as a person what it is to experience those very same seasons first within your life. And I was thinking about my calling and thinking about the process and the seasons that God has put me through. And then I begin to think about our church. Because how many know that a church is also something that's living? How many know a church, a group of people that worship the Lord together is also something that has been filled with the Spirit of God, lifted by the Spirit of God, and brought back to life? So when I think about the vision, God always puts a person through different seasons of development. And that's what God has done in me, and that's what God has done in all of us. I reflected on three particular seasons that God has led me through in bringing my calling to pass. The first season was a season of restoration. The word restore in the dictionary means to give something that was previously stolen or taken away or lost back to the original owner or recipient. How many know that we were lost? But how many know God was always our owner? And how many know that through the blood of Jesus, we made it back to our father? Somebody get happy in this place. It also means to repair or to renovate a building or a work of art or something like that. So as to return it to its original condition. I, I believe that every person goes through a season of restoration. You might be here tonight and you're just starting out on this thing. And before you get to your calling, you've got to let God restore you. You see, because God doesn't throw anything away. We throw things away. I, I've got a bunch of iPhones at home that are just sitting there, not used. And the other day I was thinking about throwing them away. And I begin to think to myself, maybe if I fix them, I can get some money for them, pay my pledge. Hey, come on, somebody. <laughs> but I came to tell you, God doesn't throw anything away. Everything that God's, God creates has value. But some of us are here tonight, and we know what it is to have been restored. God never called us to be a drug addict. God never created us to be a gang member. God never created us to have a broken marriage. God never created us to be an alcoholic. God never created us to do some of the things that we got involved in. But through the blood of Jesus, he has restored us back to our original design. And the message of that season is for you to know that God is able to rebuild our life. God is able to rebuild our life, but God is also able to place in each and every one of us a fire to rebuild. Sometimes as a leader, we forget that, that God will place a fire inside of you to build or to rebuild something for his glory. See, God is able to take whatever is broken and God is able to fix it. And God not only fixes it, watch this, but he makes it productive for his name. See, not everybody survives a season of restoration, and I'll tell you why. Because when God begins to restore you, 
Just like a doctor, come on somebody, just like a doctor wants to make you healthy, and just like a doctor wants to begin to get in there and fi figure out the problem, the doctor can't fix you till you lay on the table. So there's an element of surrender. And I thank God for where I am today, but there was a season in my life where I had to lay on the table. I had to let Dr. Jesus come in and do exactly what I needed him to do. Do you have the same testimony? I was willing to let the Lord take some things out and put some things in. I was willing to let the Lord to break me away from some things and add some things to me. I'm grateful today that I am here because of a season of restoration and a season where God brought me back. The second season I've been through and led through was a season of preparation. Someone said that the future belongs to those who prepare themselves in the right time with the right place and know how to move with the right people. When Nehemiah set to build the walls of Jericho, he, 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 he was encouraged because he said that the people had a mind to build. And, and I'm going to tell you that when you have a mind to build and you're ready to build and you've been through the restoration process. Now God says, OK, now I'm going to prepare you for what I've called you to do. You're ready. You're willing. You've submitted. And now I'm going to start preparing you for what I called you to do. And how does God prepare us? He uses people, he uses problems, and he uses pressure to prepare us for the future. It requires perseverance to make it through. When the pressure and the people and the problems begin to stack up, it's not the devil, it's God allowing it because God knows you can handle it. God knows you can handle it. See, God will never give you something that you can't handle. Tell your neighbor, you can handle it. He'll never give you something you can't handle. That's not God's personality. He'll never make you have to go through something that's too big for you, that can't be taken care of. God says, if I brought you to it, I'm going to help you through it. We should get more excited about that good news. Sometimes in the preparation process, God has to turn up the heat. See, some of you won't shout on it. You won't clap because you don't like the heat. You don't like it when God is turning up the heat in your life. You don't like it when people start to tell you stuff. You don't like when the authority figures of your life begin to step in and say, listen, there's more that God can do. God wants to change some things about your life. God wants you to submit yourself. God wants you to be patient a little bit. Come on, somebody. I thank God that in that season when my, when my leaders were dealing with me, I thank God in that season when my pastors and those who were around me were sharpening me and frustrating me and making me angry and sometimes they said what am I doing in victory outreach I thank God I stuck it out because of the people because of the problems because of the pressure I am where I am today can anybody testify to the Lord in this place see I came to tell you victory outreach San Diego God is preparing you for the future and the greater the test the greater the calling I'll say it again the greater the test the greater the calling the more challenging the test, the more that God wants to use you. See, when God is testing you, what is he doing? He's purifying you. He turns up the heat to take things out of you. When he turns up the heat and he's testing you, he's purifying your life. He's purifying your character. You know what else he's purifying? He's purifying your motives. I think there's a generation rising up in Victory Outreach that needs to understand that ministry is not a career. Ministry is a calling. That standing up here and preaching sermons is not something so that you could be lifted up. It's something so that the name of Jesus could be lifted up. Can I get anybody on that here tonight? See, he puts you through the fire because he wants to begin to purify your motives. He wants to make sure that you're ready, that when you get up, come on, somebody, you won't be embarrassed, but you'll be powerful under the anointing of God. See, he purifies our motives and then he purifies our relationships. The third season that I feel I've been through and our church has been through is not only a season of restoration and preparation, but, but thirdly, there's a season of supplication. This is a season where you've been through the fire and you've been through the testing and you've been through the restoration process and you've submitted your will to God. 
and you've said, God, Dr. Jesus, do what you got to do. How many have that testimony? Then the third season comes and it's a good season. Someone say good season. This is a season where God begins to pour out great blessing in your life. This is the season where God begins to bless you because blessing always comes after the testing. Blessing always comes after the testing. God begins to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing that you are not you're not able to contain. He begins to open up doors. He begins to introduce you to people who can help you get to the place that God has called you to go. And the blessing comes after the testing. See, God says to you who have been through that process, he says, now I can trust you. There's no greater accolade you could receive than to know that God can trust you. God says, I can trust you with the gospel. I can trust you to preach. I can trust you to minister. I can trust you to be used in the anointing. I could trust you. I could trust you. Why do people fail? It's because they try to do God's will without the trust. But when you go through the process and you let him deal with your life and deal with your character and deal with your motives and deal with your relationships. Now, God says, I can trust you. And that's when he begins to open up the windows of blessing within your life. That's when you go into a season of answered prayer. That's when you begin to see breakthrough in your ministry. That's when you begin to see all kinds of good things begin to happen. I don't know about you, but I thank God for that season of supplication. That's what God says. I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm going to give you everything you've been praying for. I'm going to begin to do it. But I do want to say something about this season. I want to give you a warning. Because if you if you find yourself tonight in a season of supplication. If you find yourself tonight in a season that says it's all good. Things are good. Things aren't perfect, but they're good. Come on now. Things will never be perfect. But how many know God is good? And you find yourself in a place where things may not be perfect, but things are good. I got a warning for you. Be careful. Look at your neighbor and tell him, be careful. Because if we're not careful, supply can turn into comfort in your life. Things that God gave you to use for his glory, you could start using them for your glory. Things that God, doors that he opened that, that he says, I want you to now, I'm supplying you for the mission. I'm supplying you for the task. I, I've given you back your dignity. I, I've given you back your testimony. I've, I, I, I've restored and fixed some things in your life. And, you know, you're walking a little bit higher now. You're walking stronger than you've ever been. You're, you're feeling good. You're even looking good. And some of us, when we came to the house of God, we didn't look so good. But look at you now. You look good. You look skinnier. Can I hear an amen? And when God begins to supply you, be careful that instead of using that for yourself, make sure you're using it for God. Because sometimes the enemy has a way of coming in and he and, and the enemy's smart. He knows how the kingdom of God works. And the enemy begins to come and it says, if I can't get them to backslide because they're not going back to heroin, they're not going back to, uh, you know, chaos. They're not going back to these things. And, and they've determined and they've drawn that line. They said, I'm never going back to drinking. I'm never going back to that crazy lifestyle. I'm never going back to confusion. And he knows you're not going back. He knows you're not going black. But what he does, he says, if I can't get them to backslide, I'll get them off track. I'll get them to miss their calling. I'll get them to think that that's, this is all there is, to be blessed and to go to church on Sunday and to drive a new car and to buy a house and to hang out and just take pictures of food at cool restaurants and wear nice clothes and have all kinds of shoes in my closet and just be blessed and God is good and that's my testimony. And oh, San Diego's so beautiful and look at, we have the beach and we have the desert and we have the zoo and we have a big whale at SeaWorld and it is good to be here. Let's build three tents, one for Jesus, one for me, and one for my kids. And God comes and says, I didn't bless you so that you could stay in that city. I didn't bless you so that you could get comfortable and miss your calling. I'm looking for somebody that's going to rise up and take this message of the gospel and this vision all over the world. Now, this is where I'm going to lose is about 75% of you. Because some of you, that's all the vision you have. 
is to live and die in San Diego and San Diego till I die. But I came to tell you the vision is bigger than San Diego. The vision is bigger than California. The vision is to reach the entire world. See, we're getting ready to go into a fourth season. Tell your neighbor we're going into a fourth season. That fourth season is on its way. And I'm ready. I'm ready for that season. I've been through all these seasons, and, and some of them have been good, some of them have been hard. You know, we've been through these seasons, and, and I thank God for those seasons, and I thank God for what he did in those seasons, but I'm ready for a new season. And God is getting ready to pour out a new season in this church, and I came to tell you God wants you to be a part of that season. What is that season? We had the season of restoration. We had the season of preparation. We had the season of supplication, but now God says, I'm bringing you to a season of expansion. I'm bringing you to a season of expansion. He says, I'm not just going to expand you here in San Diego. If you're looking at this church and we're going to open it up and 1,200 seats, and, and yes, we're going to do some cool things, and yes, it's going to happen. Tell your neighbor, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And you're going to see a lot of people who've been backslidden come back to the house of God. And you're going to see a lot of people who've been in and out of the house of God or hopping from church to church and people you know that you grew up with in high school or junior high or you know them on Facebook. They're going to start coming to check out the her church because it's going to look real pretty and it's going to have great music and we're going to have all kinds. We're going to have a lot of fun in this new building and we're going to do that. But I want you to know something. The message is never going to change. Our message is that God has given us a vision, and that vision is to reach every inner city of the world. We're going to take Europe. We're going to take Africa. We're going to take Mexico. We're going to take Panama. We're going to take the East Coast. We're going to plant churches. We're going to raise up leaders. We're going to raise up workers. We're going to raise up pastors. We're going to raise up evangelists. We're going to raise up home directors. We're going to raise up women leaders with a third way is going to be raised up right here in San Diego. We haven't lost the vision. We haven't lost the vision. God says, I'm getting ready to expand your vision all over the world. God is ready, and he's willing to do it through us. And I want to tell you, church, this, and I want you to get this inside of your head. God is not limited. I think some of us also, in our, even on my level, our level, remember, God is not limited. God is not limited to just raise up leaders for the local and not raise up leaders for the global. I mean, sometimes it blows my mind how we can believe God for finances and we can believe God for healing. and we can believe, But then we can't believe God for God to raise up leaders for the house and for the vision. Why do we have a hub? Because we want to see the third ways rise up for the vision. Why do we have our men's and our women's home? Because we're not there just getting you off drugs. We're raising up soldiers. We're raising up leaders in our men's and women's home. See, leaders, you've got to begin to believe. You've got to begin to believe that God is able to raise up leaders for the local, but God is also able to raise up leaders for the local, for the global vision simultaneously. You never know who you're sitting next to. Yes, God may have called you to be a leader and a producer and a disciple in this church, but you could be sitting next to the next person who's going to Africa, going to Panama, going to the East Coast. We serve a God that is not limited. And you know what? God is not looking for perfect vessels. In fact, God is looking for people who are actually imperfect. The Bible says that he chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. It's a mystery. There's a doctrine going around you know, the cities and they're saying, oh, once saved, always saved. And, and, you know, God elects you to get saved. And, and who he wants to go to hell goes to hell. And those he wants saved, you know, that sounds like Islam to me. That sounds like people who, who they don't know they're going to get in until they get there. I came to tell you that's not God. 
We serve a God that says, I chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God says, I called people who were willing to be obedient and lay their life down on the altar of sacrifice. And if you surrender to God, there's no limit to what God could do in your life. I don't play with all that false doctrine. And it's big doctrine. But I came to tell you, we need a generation that God understand that the calling of God is a mystery. How do you reconcile standing up here? I'm just, I'm, Holy Ghost is on me right now. This is not in my notes. Because I get so tired of this one saved, always saved doctrine that you can, oh, I'm elect so I can drink and I can party and I'm still going to heaven. The devil has lied to you, my brother. The devil has lied to you, my sister. How do you reconcile standing up here and building a ministry? On people who were hooked on heroin. People who were lost and coming out of prison and their family rejected them. And standing up here and saying, the Lord has chosen some of you to be prophets and apostles and pastors. Isn't that what the Bible said? And evangelists and preachers and God is going to raise you up and send you all over the world. I'll tell you, I preach it time and again and I haven't understand it. I'll tell you why I don't understand it. Because I'm not God. We serve a God that is able to take the foolish things of the world and confound the wise. The calling of God is a mystery. Tell your neighbor, it's a mystery. That's why God will go and mess around and choose somebody that you would never choose. You think you're all bad and God just passes over you and chooses the fool who's submitting to God and giving his all to God and not playing games in the house of God. I think God does it to make fun of us. Because he wants you to know you're not God. You don't do the choosing. He says, I'm God. I do the choosing. I do the separating. I do the restoring. I do the preparation. I give them what they need. And once they have everything they need, then I begin to raise them up and I begin to send them out in my timing. Lord, give us discernment. Lord, give us wisdom. Lord, give us guidance. Lord, let your spirit lead us. We want to raise up leaders right here at Victory Outreach San Diego. Am I preaching too loud? Can you clap for the Lord in this place? Can you say, yes, that's me? Tell your neighbor, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. My job isn't to try to figure it out. My job is to preach it. And to believe it with all my heart. Read all books you want. It's a mystery. Go on all the YouTube videos you want. It's a mystery. What my Bible tells me is that God told Elijah to go find himself an Elisha. Does your Bible say the same thing? (laughs) My Bible tells me That Elijah's day was coming to an end. But the move of God was just getting ready to get started. My Bible tells me that God told Elijah to go to Elisha because Elisha had been set apart by God. Commanded him to go see this young man. And the Bible says that he went And he took his mantle, just like in this service tonight. I told you it's going to be a dangerous service. And he threw his mantle, his cloak on him. And Elisha was preparing, and he knew what that meant. Come on, somebody. He knew what, just like when your pastor calls you to have a meeting with you, you're like, ooh, I know what that means. It's either going to be bad or it's going to be good. (laughs) And he threw that mantle on him. And the first point is that there is a calling on your life. We read about it in verse 19. Recognize that something important was happening here. First thing is that the calling of God 
never begins in your heart. It always begins in God's heart first. This ministry didn't begin in the heart of Pastor Sonny and Julie. This ministry began in the heart of God. It began in the throne room of God. Can I hear an amen? And I think we need to understand that. Because when Elijah came and threw that mantle on Elisha, he was telling him, you're going to be my successor. You're going to be the one, you're the one that God has chosen to take my ministry that I spent my whole life building, and you're going to take my ministry into the next dimension. See, God says this to us, that where there's no successor, there can be no success. Parents, that's why you've got to understand the calling of God and how you lead your children and how you guide your children. That there's no success without a successor. We've got to use wisdom because God always needs a man or a woman that he can work through. I'm not sure why, but that's just the way God wants it. And he looks for those imperfect vessels. The Ministry of Victory Outreach, if you're new, I want you to hear this tonight. Especially if you're new. The ministry of Victor Outreach was not built on the capable. The vision was built on the willing. Hear that and hear that clear. Yes, we need capable people. But in Victory Outreach, God takes the willing and makes them capable. He's not looking for sharp tools. He's looking for tools he can sharpen. Are you hearing me tonight? See, never allow the capable to boast against the willing. Well, I can do this and I can do that. It means nothing to me till you do it. <laughs> so many people are so proud and arrogant and boastful and I've got all the education and I've got all the connections and I have all the ability. Yeah, but you ain't doing nothing. Give me somebody that wants to do something. That's someone that's going to show me their resume. We need people in our church, in our ministry, that are going to understand. You say, you know what? I may not have it all together, but I'm willing. I'm willing. The calling of God begins in the heart of God, and then it pours out to us. And then also, the calling of God usually involves the element of surprise. The element of surprise. Whenever God calls you, and chooses you for something, chances are you don't know it's coming. <laughs> if you want to know, talk to Sam. Talk to Tim and Jen. Talk to Aldo. Talk to David. Talk, talk to different people. Talk to my wife. Because whenever God calls you, he never does it in your convenience. We're dealing with a generation of convenience. And Jesus dealt with the same thing in his generation when it came to the calling of God. Now, the second thing we should know about this calling, are you getting something tonight? Is there has to be a choice. There has to be a choice. You read about it in verse 20. That Elisha, he recognized that not only did the calling come with the element of surprise, but it also came with the element of surrender. The element of surrender. I think that humility and surrender is something we need to get inside of people more and more. So many people walk proud and, you know, walk in a way where God can't use them. Because the Bible says that he resists the proud, but he gives grace to what? To the humble. And when you understand that the calling comes with the element of surprise and is never going to come at your convenience, right? That all of a sudden... You recognize in order to step into it, there has to be an element of surrender. See, the calling of God, hear me and hear me clear, is going out every service. That's what we do when we're here. We, we, we're just seed scatterers. When I come up here to preach on Sunday or on Wednesday night or any time I get in front of people, I just come with a bag of seed. And I just get on this microphone and I reach into my spiritual bag of seed and I just go, whew, whew, whew. 
And then sometimes there's a tough section, and I go, Froom. and then I go, <laughs> you need a lot of seed, man, because you got a hard heart. Paul said, one plants, another waters, but God gives the increase. And that's what Jesus did. All he did was plant seed and do miracles, plant seed and do miracles. He said, if you don't want the seed, look at the miracle. You don't want the seed, look at the miracle. You don't want the seed, look at the miracle. Foo, blind eyes are open. The lame are walking, jumping, leaping. The deaf can hear. The leper is cleansed. Here's some seed. Believe it or not. And there were those that the calling went out to, but they missed it. The rich young ruler, he allowed the riches of his life and a spirit of self-righteousness to hold him back from being everything that God wanted him to be. Three men came to Jesus and said, hey, we want to follow you wherever you go. He said, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head or a place to rest. And you still want to follow me? They said, hold up. My father's dying. Let me go bury him. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Let that old life bury it. Those old things that have been holding you back too long from answering the call of God, put them in the grave, turn your back on them, and follow me to your destiny. Follow my calling. Follow my purpose. Ooh. So you lose a crowd. When you talk about commitment, you lose a crowd. But when you talk about commitment, the people who want everything God has for them begin to come alive. Their heart begins to leap. Their heart begins to beat. They begin to sweat. They begin to move around. They said, this is what I have been waiting for because God has called me to make a choice. The great Catherine Coleman, the healing evangelist, was once asked. This is for women, too. Ladies, are you out there? Man, that's a small group. <laughs> Ladies, are you out there? She was asked about her calling to be a healing evangelist. She was packing it out wherever she went. Miracles were taking place. She was very anointed. But she was always highly criticized, highly spoken about. People talked about her, ridiculed her made fun of her. And when someone once asked her about her calling to be a healing evangelist, she said, my calling was for a man, but that man refused. So God, instead of giving it to a man, he gave it to a woman. He gave it to a woman of faith. He gave it to a woman of power. That's why some of you men, your women are more powerful than you. You know why? Because they're answering the call of God within their life. Thank God for those who say yes to God. Thank God for those who are willing. And they not only do it with a willing heart, they do it with a joyful heart. They don't follow God grudgingly. They don't follow God in anger and resentment and, you know, oh, you know, in a woe is me mentality. Thank God for those who leap at the task. Thank God for those who leap at the calling. I thank God. I remember when, when, when I received my calling. I'd known God had called me. I'd felt it. I had felt the mantle on me, but I didn't have an opportunity. And remember, I had this little discipleship home with a few little rebellious guys, you know, and, you know, they were just, I think they were more like living there, and they were like, it was like a hotel instead of, a, I'm scattering seed, they don't catch it, scattering seed, they don't catch it, you know, but they're there, they're there, okay, praise God, I'm trying. And my pastor sees me and Georgina there trying. And one day he calls me to his house. Get a phone call. Hey, I want you to come over. He never called me before, never summons me like that. So what's the first thing that goes to your mind? He said, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so a little four-minute drive to his house. I'm like, man, what did I do? What did I say? One of these guys talk about me. You know, they're probably saying, I don't know what I'm doing and what's going on. And he's going to want to, you know, and it wasn't like an official home. I remember when I asked him to open the home, he goes, I'm not giving you no money. <laughs> I said, I'm not asking for money. I just want to get your blessing. He goes, 
Yeah, yeah, but whatever you do, that, that's your thing. <laughs> oh, no, I came up the hard way, guys. Nothing was handed to me. So that's your thing. You know, I think he was figuring if anything goes bad, I'm not want him to use the name of Victory Outreach. <laughs> so I get this call, and, and I come, and Pastor Sonny goes, I want to talk to you. Sit down. We, there's this new thing that we want to do, vision that God gave us. It's in our mission statement. That God not only called us to raise up churches, but God also called us to raise up training centers. And I'm looking at you, and I want to know, are you willing to go? And I go, well, where is it going to be? In the East Coast, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Where in the world <laughs> is Bridgeport, Connecticut? It's, it's, out, it's way out there. It's way out there. It's about 4,000 miles away. He said, but are you willing to go? And I'm going to tell you, I didn't tell him, let me pray about it. Well, let me go talk to Georgina. Georgina didn't go to me, it was just me. Or let me, you know, uh, fast for 21 days and 21 nights. Once he told me the mission, and once he told me where it was, my spirit leaped. I said, yes, I'm ready to go. When do we go? I told him I'm ready to go right now. My house is in order. My finances are in order. My mind is in order. My heart is in order. My vision is in order. He said, slow down. I said, I want to go now. He said, take it easy. He said, I was thinking in January. I go, no, not January. I don't want to wait till January. He said, well, we're not going to open up till January. It was September. And we're not going to open up until January. I go, oh, I'm not waiting till January. He goes, what do you want to go? I want to go now. He said, you know, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> and I said, I need a team. I need a team. I need a team. He goes, oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you looked at Tim. You guys, he goes, oh, I don't know. He goes, I'll tell you what you do. He said, take all those guys in your home. <laughs> he says, I'll give you a van. I think those guys were still sleeping in their bunk beds. But you know what I did? I didn't complain. I said, I need a team. I need more. No, I went back to the house. I said, get your lazy behinds out of bed. We are going to Bridgeport, Connecticut to open up a training center. And today we have training centers all over the world because we lived at the calling of God. And I wrapped up those goats and I took them with me. I wasn't expecting the calling to come, but when the calling came, I was ready. See, and then there's the final thing as you come to the keyboard. How many are hearing this message tonight? How, how many of you feel this is a necessary word? Can we clap for Jesus if you feel it? There was finally, finally, not only a call in Elisha's life and a choice, but then lastly, a chase, a pursuit of God's will a pursuit of the vision that God gave him. Elijah told him this. He says, here's the mantle, but understand he received the mantle, but he had not yet received the anointing. He told him this, if you could keep up with me. Elijah said, I'm not done yet. I got a little bit of time. He says, if you see me when the Lord takes me, in other words, to see someone, you got to be right there next to him. Come on, somebody. If you see me when the Lord takes me, then the anointing will come. So there's, there's Elisha, and it's time. And he knows it's time. And Elijah's, he's getting ready to get raptured. You know the story. Who knows the story? And that chariot of fire is coming. And he says, son, son, ask me for what you want. And I will give it to you because you pursued me and you didn't backslide and you didn't mess up and, and you walked with me all these years. And, and you tell me what he says, I want a double portion of your anointing. 
I don't want the level of anointing you have. He says, I want double. And did Elijah withhold that? He said, that double portion of that anointing shall be granted to you. And you know, when you study Elisha's life, he did exactly twice the amount of miracles that Elijah did. This is good. He did twice the miracles that his father did. There's a third wave rising up. There's a third wave here. That you're going to do double what we did. You're going to do double. <laughs> you're going to do double, man. But you've got to be willing to pursue the vision. You've you got to be willing tonight. To, I'm, I'm tired of those old things, those dead things. I wasn't created for this. I was created to do God's work, to answer the call of God. I'm not going to play no games anymore. I'm going to make some decisions. We had one young man in our church who was working. He says, I quit my job because I'm going into full-time ministry here in the church. And he's not even getting paid. He's just willing. He goes, I, I'm, I'm going to let that go. Because I feel that there's a calling of God upon my life. Would you stand with me? Tonight, Lord, we pray that you would raise up a third wave that will reach the world for Jesus. Raise up a church that will not only reach our city, but we could reach the world through willing and capable leaders. But Lord, we have to come to a place where we make a choice and we say, God, my life is not my own. My life belongs to you. I want to just surrender my entire life to you. And if this message hit your heart and you feel that this is God's word for you tonight, and you say, I feel called by God, then I want you to slip on out of your seat.